In this video, we're going to be talking about the closed loop transfer function and the open loop transfer function. And we're going to go over where they come from, when to use each one, and how they relate to the root locus diagram and Bode plots. Basically, this is going to be a conceptual overview of classical control theory. I'm going to first go over everything and write it all out on paper here. And then I'll go ahead and review it all once again a little bit quicker with a PowerPoint that I made. And I'll give a summary of everything at the end. And as always, there's going to be timestamps in the description down below. So if you want to jump to any point of the video, you can feel free to do that. But with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. So we're going to be talking about feedback control. So let's go ahead and draw a basic feedback control block diagram. So we have an input. We'll call that X. It goes into a summing junction. And then this is just going to be proportional control. So we'll draw a gain block called the gain K. And then that goes into our plant, G of S. And then we have our output Y, which is fed back through our feedback transfer function, H of S. And then that goes back into the summing junction with negative feedback and positive from the X. And this is our basic block diagram for a proportionally controlled feedback control system. We can find the transfer function of this system here algebraically, or maybe you just know the rule for feedback systems, uh, but it's going to be y over x, output over input, is equal to the feed forward path k g of s all over 1 plus feed forward again k g of s, and then the feedback h of s. So this is the transfer function for the whole system. So we call that the closed loop transfer function on right, CLTF for short. So that's a closed loop transfer function. So that transfer function is the whole thing. So that includes the, the feedback and the loop is closed. So that's why we call it a closed loop. So this characterizes the entire system and everything it does. So we know from basic system analysis that a system is characterized by its poles. So more specifically, the, the poles of the transfer function of the system tell you what the system is going to do. So the poles are where the denominator is equal to zero. So we can solve for those using what we call a characteristic equation, which will in this case be 1 plus k g of s, h of s, and we're going to set that equal to zero. So this is called the characteristic equation. So C, E. The solutions to the characteristic equation are just the values of S, where the denominator is equal to zero, or the poles of the system. And we see that the only transfer function we have to worry about in this characteristic equation is just whatever G of S times H of S is. So we give that a different name, and we call that the open loop transfer function, so OLTF. And this is useful for when we're looking for the poles. So we'll see what that does. So when doing a proportionally controlled control problem, what we usually want to know is what value of k we want to go with. So we're going to have to solve this and figure out which k will give us the poles that we want. So one way to do that is to try every possible value of k. And what that ends up giving us is the root locus diagram, which is just a plot of every pole or every solution to the characteristic equation for every different k value. So let's just draw an example of what a root locus diagram might look like. Now I'm not going to be going over how to draw a root locus diagram in this video, but I'm just going to draw a quick example and talk about the basics. So RL diagram for root locus. And we have two axes. Horizontal is real and vertical is imaginary. So the way that you draw a root locus diagram is you start with drawing all the poles and zeros of the open loop transfer function. So that's going to be whatever is on the bottom of this transfer function. If you set that equal to zero and solve for all the values of s, that's going to be your poles. And if you set whatever is in the numerator of g times h equal to zero, that's going to give you your zeros of the open loop transfer function. So that's where you start with a root locus diagram. So we can just imagine that maybe this is a three pole system, which is pretty common. So maybe a pole here, pole there, pole here. And 
then when you draw the root locus diagram, you end up with branches connecting all the poles to zeros. So this one will end up looking like there'll be a branch coming off this way, going to infinity that way, and then there'll be a branch that connects these two and meets in the middle and then goes off, just trying to draw this a little darker, to infinity in these two directions. And this is just a rough sketch of what this is going to look like. So we have to keep in mind that these x's, those are the poles of the open loop transfer function, but the branches tell us what all the possible poles of the closed loop transfer function are going to be. And we worry about the poles of the closed loop transfer function because that's going to tell us the behavior of our entire system. So those poles, each one we can write in the form of s equals sigma plus j omega where sigma is the real part and then omega is the imaginary part and j is our imaginary number. Uh, you can write i too if you're so inclined. So another thing we know from system analysis is that if the poles are in the right half plane over here, meaning they have a positive real part, then the system is going to be unstable and go off to infinity. So we see that where that happens on a root locus diagram is right here and here where it crosses the imaginary axis. So that's going to be where s is equal to j omega. So that's going to be an important point for us. That's where the system is going to go unstable. So if we rewrite the characteristic equation with this, we're going to get 1 plus k g of j omega, h of j omega is equal to 0. And we can rearrange this, put the 1 on the other side, and we're going to get k g of j omega h of j omega is equal to negative 1. And now I'm going to rewrite this one more time, and this time I'm going to write this negative 1 in vector form. So if we think about the, uh, the real imaginary plane here, this is imaginary, this is real, negative 1 is going to be right here, because there's no imaginary part, it's all real, so it's going to be a vector that looks like that and it's gonna have an angle measuring from the real axis of 180 degrees, or you can go negative 180 degrees, or you can go around once and a half and get that angle, but we'll just stick for now with positive and negative 180. So we'll rewrite it with that. Kg of j omega, h of j omega is equal to, it has a magnitude of one, and then an angle of positive or negative 180 degrees. So now when we see this, we can say, okay, we have a transfer function that's in terms of j omega, and then it has a magnitude and a phase, basically. So when we're worried about magnitude and phase with something that's varying with omega or frequency, we tend to look towards Bode plots. So let's take a look at a couple of example Bode plots. And remember that the magnitude part of most Bode plots is in decibels. So let's convert this one magnitude to decibels. And that's going to be 1 is equal to 20 log of 1 decibels. And that's just going to be 0 since log of 1 is 0. So we'll keep that in mind when we draw these Bode plots. All right, so I got a new sheet of paper here. And we'll go ahead and just draw a couple of example Bode plots. So I'll have two different plots. This one's going to be the magnitude and this one's going to be the phase. Let's keep in mind that these are going to be the Bode plots of the open loop transfer function times k because that's what we're looking for with the magnitude of 1 and a phase of 180 degrees. So let's say that they end up looking something like this. It comes out, and then magnitude usually drops down, goes forever, and then the phase typically looks something like this, where it's constant, and then it drops down, and then it's constant at a different point. So the important points we're looking for here are going to be at 0 decibels and negative 180 degrees, or that could be positive, but we'll just leave it as negative for now because you're going to see that more commonly. So let's see where the magnitude crosses 0 decibels. So it crosses here, and then if we drop that point down to the phase plot, we can see how far the phase at that point is from negative 180. And we call that the phase margin, or I'll write PM. 
And then if we look at where the phase crosses negative 180 and bring that frequency, and I uh, forgot to mention that the x-axis here is omega, which is the angular frequency. So at the frequency where the phase crosses negative 180, here we'll see what the magnitude is, and we'll see how far that is from our zero decibel point. And that distance is called the gain margin, or gm. And the phase margin and gain margin are ways to see how far your system is from instability, or basically how stable it's going to be. Because if you are right next to instability, if your real system is just a little bit different than what your model is that you're using to design the controller, you might be in a dangerous situation. So we use the gain margin and the phase margin to say, okay, we have a little bit of wiggle room before the system becomes unstable. So the reason that this is so important is that if you were to increase the gain, what you basically do is you take this magnitude line and you just shift the whole thing up. So you can see that when you shift that up, you're going to decrease this gain margin and the phase margin is also going to decrease. So eventually you reach the point, which is the point here on the root locus diagram where you reach instability. Now, these are the Bode plots of the open loop transfer function. And you might be wondering, well, what about the Bode plot of the closed loop transfer function? And you can definitely draw those too, but it's not going to tell you about the stability margins. Instead, it's just going to give you the overall frequency response of the whole system. So if you're looking for something like the bandwidth of the entire feedback system, then you might want to plot those Bode plots and take a look at what the frequency response is. But if you're worried about stability, then you have to look at the open loop transfer function Bode plots. So now I'm going to hop over to my computer and go through my PowerPoint, and we'll just go over all this stuff again a little bit quicker, and it'll look a little cleaner. All right, so here we are in my PowerPoint, and like before, we're going to start with the basic feedback block diagram. So we have X coming in, K, which is our proportional controller, G and H, which are our other transfer functions, and then Y is the output. And like before, we know that the transfer function of this system is going to be the top over 1 plus the top times the bottom. So that's here. And then that we're going to call the closed loop transfer function. And the closed loop transfer function tells us all about what the entire system is going to do. And if we want to know about that, we're going to have to look at the poles of this transfer function. So we know that the system is characterized by its poles, which are the values of s, where the denominator is equal to 0. So we'll set the denominator equal to zero and call that the characteristic equation. And in the characteristic equation, we call that g of s times h of s, the open loop transfer function. And the root locus diagram is the solution to the characteristic equation for all possible values of k. So we're going to use the poles and zeros of the open loop transfer function to draw the root locus diagram. So to start, we'll have our axes with the real on the horizontal and the imaginary on the vertical. And first, we'll draw the poles and zeros of the open loop transfer function. And once again, we're going to be looking at uh, just a simple three pole open loop transfer function. And then the branches of that, those are going to give us the pole locations of the closed loop transfer function for varying values of k. So we know that the poles can be represented as s equals sigma plus j omega and that the system is going to be unstable when the poles exist on the right half plane. And on the root locus, we see that this point is where s is equal to j omega, and we can rewrite the characteristic equation replacing s with j omega, and also moving that 1 to the other side. And then we change that negative 1 to be in vector form, and we're going to get one with an angle of 180 degrees. So now that we have a system in terms of j omega, as well as a magnitude and a phase, we can go ahead and look at the Bode plots to see where k times open loop transfer function has a magnitude of one and a phase of 180 degrees. So we have to keep in mind that a magnitude of one is gonna be equal to zero decibels, and then we can draw our Bode plots. So we're gonna have magnitude on the top, phase on the bottom, and the x is the frequency omega. So we'll just draw in some shapes here and mark where zero decibels is and negative 180 degrees, and then drop that zero decibel point down to the phase plot, and that's gonna show us what the phase margin is and bring the point where the phase is equal to negative 180 degrees up to the magnitude plot, and that's gonna give us our gain margin. 
And keep in mind here that these plots are of the open loop transfer function and not the closed loop transfer function, but they tell us about the stability of the closed loop transfer function. So if at this point you want to pause and maybe take a, a screenshot of this page, I think this pretty much sums up everything we talked about pretty well. And we'll go ahead now and just do a quick summary. So the closed loop transfer function is the one that characterizes the entire feedback system. So we have k g of s over 1 plus k g of s h of s. The open loop transfer function is just the g of s times h of s, which appears in our characteristic equation, which tells us about the poles of the closed loop transfer function and therefore how the closed loop transfer function acts. In the root locus diagram, we use the poles and zeros of the open loop transfer function to draw it, but then the branches of that root locus diagram tell us about the pole locations of the closed loop transfer function for all different values of k. And for Bode plots, we draw the Bode plot of the open loop transfer function times k to see what the stability margins of our system are. And we draw the Bode plot of the closed loop transfer function to see what the overall system response is. So that's not going to tell us about stability, but just our frequency response. And from that, we can get something like the bandwidth of the whole system. And with that, that's pretty much a general broad strokes overview of feedback control. And thanks for watching.